over the last three weeks in 2 Thessalonians, we've seen Paul has a very great concern for the faith of God's people in that church at Thessalonica. He really wants them to keep going with their faith. And today, in our last chapter, chapter 3, Paul addresses one last threat, and it's different to the two others that we've seen in the first two chapters. Persecution and false teaching very often come from outside the church. But this week's threat is maybe even more dangerous because it lurks inside the church. It's a hidden infection circulating in our midst, the threat of sin. And even the best churches, like the one in Thessalonica, face this threat because until Jesus returns, sin is among us. Sin is in us, in our flesh. Do you feel the threat of sin in our church? In yourself. Certainly, Paul treats this issue very seriously and with uh, serious measures. So, let's look at this passage in three parts today. Three parts. First, what's going on? What sin is happening in that church? Second, is the risk, that's what's, what's the threat of this sin amongst God's church? And third, What to do? So what measures does Paul give to deal with this threat of sin in the church? So three parts. What's going on? What's at risk? And what to do? First, what's going on? Let's look what was happening in this church. Did you see the problem as we read the passage? Verses 11 and 12. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy... They are busybodies. Such people need to settle down and earn the food they eat. Some in this church had given up working. They had quit their jobs. And so they were becoming dependent on the generosity of their church family to get food. Now Paul uses the word idle three times to describe these people. So let's call them idlers, meaning they aren't doing anything useful or productive. They're not earning for themselves, so they're becoming a burden to other people in the church. And worse still, they're becoming disruptive and interfering in the work of others. They're not busy, but busybodies. See, when we aren't really being useful, we don't sort of usually remain neutral, we very quickly become a bother to others. And it's important to see in this, uh, this uh, situation that it's a willing choice that's being made by these church members. So look at the rule that Paul gives them at the end of verse 10. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Paul is talking about people who are choosing not to work, who are unwilling. And it's important to see this because today many struggle to find employment. And at the moment, especially, it can be very hard to find work. Paul is not saying unemployment is wrong. He's saying if you are able to work, can work, but you choose not to, then that is wrong. It's wrong, Paul says, because there's a direct correct connection between work and food. Here's a clear statement in the Bible about the goodness of work. Work is good, not because it's my identity and it gives me status in society, not because work is my gateway to riches and fame and luxury, but because work provides food. We work to eat. And so if we aren't working, but are still eating, then we must be eating food that someone has work, else has worked for. That is, we aren't burdening someone else when we could be responsible. 
That's the situation in this church. And we can see that these idlers are responding to Paul's teaching. In verses 6 and 10, he says, we've talked about this before. It's not a new uh, conversation. And we also see it coming up earlier in the other letter, 1 Thessalonians. And we see there in chapter 5, Paul's warning, warn those who are idle and disruptive. It also stands against Paul's deliberate example when he was with them. As Andrew introduced before the reading, Paul told this church to imitate him. And what did he do when he was with them? He worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so as not to be a burden on this church. He had a right to their support, he says. It would have been right for him to ask them to support him for his work. But he refused to claim that right because he wanted them to imitate him and his hard work. So these idlers are being deliberately disobedient, irresponsible and rebellious. And they're bringing trouble into this church. So point two, what's at risk here? Or what's the threat of this sin in the church? We might expect Paul to talk about what might seem more serious sins, like terrible sexual immorality or conflict that is dividing the church. But a few people not working? Is this really the issue to fuss about? Well, by Paul's seriousness, we see that all sin is dangerous. All sin must be avoided in God's church. And there are at least three ways I can see in our passage that sin threatens the church. So let's look at these three. First, we see that sin affects the unity, the loving unity of the church. Love binds us together. It's the sign of true disciples of Jesus, love. Jesus said this, disciples this is how people will know you are my disciples your love for one another and if you've known Jesus for any length of time you are captivated by his love he gave up his heavenly glory for us he came into this world and gave his life to pay for us our sins this is love giving yourself for the sake of others paying a cost when someone else needs. And when you live in a community, a church family that's committed to that kind of living, it's heaven. There's no need among us because love sees needs and meets them. Now, this was high stakes for the church in the first century. Social welfare payments didn't exist. There's no Centrelink. No job, no money, no food. When someone was in need, the church might have been the first and last option for help. And so in Thessalonica, it seems we see a church that is generously providing for each other. But love is tested by sin. How do you keep loving someone when you feel they might be taking advantage? You're giving generously and now they just seem to expect it. Paul says it's actually unloving to allow someone to become dependent like this. And so he lays down that rule in verse 10. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So Paul is telling the church... Stop feeding these idlers. Isn't this a test of love? How hard it is to leave a brother or sister without food. That is not an easy conversation. I'm not feeding you anymore. You need to take responsibility. It's, it might be the right thing to do, but it's not an easy conversation you'll probably find it's just easier to keep giving the food 
even if you don't want to, rather than having that conversation. See, love is hard. Sin is relational. It's an abuse of love. It's being a cost to others. It's very often hard and draining to think about what's loving for someone, let alone actually doing it. It very often involves hard and uncomfortable conversations. I think this is what Paul is getting at in verse 13 as he talks to this church that has these idlers in it. He says in verse 13, I have a job, and as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. See, churches get tired loving people who are hard to love, people who sin, and we all sin. It's a slog. We need encouragement. We see a similar idea in verse 5. Paul prays, May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Churches with sinful people need God's love and Christ's perseverance because sin threatens our unity. Are you worn down and tired by the demands of love for your church family. It's a reality. Life at church can be hard. And we really hurt each other sometimes in our sin. Pray for God's love and Christ's perseverance. Jesus knows what it's like to be drained loving sinners. Pray for Christ's perseverance. A second threat related to the first sin in our midst sin amongst us threatens our witness and our outreach to the world in four, uh, 1 Thessalonians Paul's talking about this same issue and in verse uh, chapter 4 11 and 12 he says make it your ambition to lead a quiet life you should mind your business and work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect outsiders. If the Christians are the idlers, what hope are we of winning the world? How can we win them if they don't even respect us? Christ is coming soon in judgment. Paul is travelling and preaching. The church is praying that the gospel will spread ahead, speed ahead in the world. So how must God's people live? In love. Love is beautiful and compelling. It highlights the gospel. It is mesmerizing to a world stuck in sin. Love points to Jesus. Where there is sin, it is anti love, anti gospel. It's becoming a cost, not paying a cost for others. But Jesus is transforming us, his people, into a loving community in the image of his son, in the image of Jesus. He brings us together that we together would demonstrate his love to the world. That's why we're together. And this is how people will know we follow Jesus. But where there is sin... There is disorder, there is community breakdown, there is a failure in love and we begin to just look the same as the world around us. This issue that uh, Paul's dealing with in that church uh, of work and idleness, Paul says, be ambitious about leading a quiet life to win the respect of others, outsiders. And in today's passage, he commands the idlers very similarly to settle down or work quietly, the same words, and earn the food they eat. Now, this might seem to us like uh, the opposite of ambition, just leading a quiet life. Is that really gospel ambition? Will quietness lead to the spread of the gospel? 
Well, here's what I think he means. By not working, these idlers are living noisy and disruptive lives. They're fearing others and demanding love. But to live a quiet life is the opposite. Not disrupting others, not interfering, not being a busybody, not becoming a burden, not demanding love to meet your needs, but working hard to provide for yourself and for others. There is an attractive beauty in this kind of stable and dependable, quiet life. And we should aspire to it. That should be our ambition, Paul says. In our world today, we might classify certain jobs as more respectable than others. If you want to win respect in the world, you need a respectable job. But Paul says, work with your hands. In other words, labouring is fine. Work hard. Earn a living. Provide for yourself and others. That is love. That will win respect. I know a bunch of people like this who work consistently and steadily over many years in unglamorous jobs to provide for their family and to share with their church family. And it's a beautiful thing. But selfish sin among God's people, that will threaten our respect to the world. That will threaten our outreach with the gospel to the world. Third and final threat. Sin threatens the faith of God's people. And sin is a threat to both the offender and the victim and their faith. See, Paul very seriously, tells the church to keep away from idle sinners. So these offenders are just one step away from disappearing from God's people for, for good. Ongoing sin is out of God's church. And for those in the church who are sinned against, it's easy to lose heart, to lose energy, to lose the will to love. When we've been hurt, there are scars and it can be very hard to hurt, separate that hurt from how we feel about God. I've known people to give up on Jesus because they've been terribly hurt by God's people and they just can't get past it. See, sin threatens the faith of the church. The one who has sinned and the one who is sinned against. So, what, what to do? What do we do when there's sin in the church? We've seen the sin problem at Thessalonica. We've seen the serious threat that it is to the church. So what does Paul uh, tell the church to do? How does he address this problem? We'll see what serious actions he takes. First, to the idlers, Paul simply says, stop it. Get to work and earn your food. When it comes to selfish, sometimes we just need to be told, it's not right, don't do it. It's amazing how just saying it sometimes can cut through the excuses. I remember a situation when I was at university and I was reasoning, making lots of excuses with my uni friends in those days about how it might be okay to download music and software online. The music industry is greedy and corrupt. The loss of profit is built into their model. They expect people to download. No one's going to catch us. They're only really concerned about the really bad offenders. And then someone just plainly said to me, stop it, it's stealing. And so I did. It's what I needed to hear. And notice the authority which, uh, with which Paul says it. Verse 6, we command you. Verse 6 again, live according to our teaching. Verse 10, when we were with you, we gave you this rule. Verse 12, such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
verse 14, obey our instruction in this letter. Generally, our world today is very resistant to authority. Well, that's uh, what some Australians would call an Australian quality, resistance to authority, especially commands. We react badly. Just look at our society when government health orders come out. Resistance, questioning, arguing, mocking, even some people not obeying. See, commands seem very old-fashioned in our society, especially for grown adults. But even kids these days will likely say to adults, who are you to tell me what to do? And this attitude in our society can make the Bible hard to hear. Imagine you came to church today and heard the preacher declare verse 4. Well, you don't have to listen. Listen, verse 4. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. It's a bit heavy, isn't it? I think churches in our world today are in danger of neglecting the authority of God. We feel it's much more comfortable if we all just come up with what we think Jesus would say is best. Commands are a bit too harsh. But the problem is there is a definite standard that Jesus expects. And if we accept him as our Lord and Master, as our boss, our commander, that's what Lord means, then we must recognise and submit to his authority. Look again at verse 6. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you. See, it's by Jesus' authority that the apostle commands. He isn't speaking on his own. He's met Jesus. He's been taught by Jesus and now he's passing on Jesus' command. As out of place as these commands feel in our society that wants to create its own laws, we must be careful to hear the commands of Scripture which we've been taught. And if we accept Christ as Lord, we must obey Him because we've accepted Him as our authority, our Lord. So if you're continuing in sin, stop it. When we take the authority of our Lord seriously, the serious consequences for rebellion make more sense. And that's Paul's next step for this church in Thessalonica. He says, keep away from these rebellious idlers. Verse 6, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. And he says something similar at the end of this passage, verse 4, to reinforce this point. Take special note of anyone who doesn't obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. See, if we as a church are a group of people who have accepted Christ as our Lord and therefore we take together seriously his commands, when there are people among us who repeatedly refuse to accept Jesus' authority, then there comes a time that we distance ourselves from them, for they are not acting as his people. Now, this isn't a small thing. The passage shows us it's not an individual decision for us each to decide for ourselves to ignore others in the church. It's not a decision that's made quickly or lightly. It's not an excuse to stop talking to someone who might annoy you. But it's a church decision to be done together when someone is openly continuing in sin and refusing to obey. It's not done angrily. It's not done for payback or to prove a point. It's done for the good of the person in order that they may feel ashamed, Paul says, and turn back to God. Paul says, separate them from your gatherings, 
from your meals, but don't give up on them. Look at verse 15. Yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. See, this serious action is to be done out of love, with longing that your fellow believer would be restored. And we need to see here that the forgiveness of Jesus is very great. He died on the cross, no less, to pay. And his grace is available, his forgiveness, for all who will turn back to him. Friends, this kind of serious action will be painful for a church. It has been in our church. It is necessary and it is loving. So we've seen the seriousness of the threat of sin and the seriousness of the consequences for sin in the church. It's not a threat we can ignore. Jesus is Lord and He's returning as judge. But as with each of the threats to this church we've been looking at over the last three weeks, Paul is still confident. God is at work and he will enable his people to keep going as we deal with difficult circumstances like in this passage. Verse 4, we have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. The Lord Jesus so touched our hearts with the good news of the gospel and come to us by his spirit with power that we are moved to hear and obey his loving command. In all the challenges of opposition, of false teaching, of sin, the God of peace will rule in the hearts of his people as we draw near to him. Look at verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. At all times and in every way, may the Lord be with us and may his peace guard our hearts and our minds. Let's pray. Our great God, we thank and praise you for Jesus and for his very great forgiveness. Thank you for his mesmerizing love that he came to this world for us to give his life to save us from our sin. And so, Father, please help us to take sin seriously as we see the cost of the life of your Son. Please help us to see the threat of sin in ourselves and help us to keep turning back to you. We thank you that your way is best. Thank you that you're changing us now to live your way. Please help us to be loving and patient with each other, to be your loving community so that uh, the world around us would respect us and there would be opportunities for us to share the good news of your son. We thank you for this passage which shows us the seriousness of sin. So please help us to remember this and to turn from sin. Help us to encourage each other, keep loving each other. In Jesus' name, amen.